This is worship for Sunday, August the 9th, which liturgically is known as uh, the 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Slightly ironic, really, because no time's ordinary at the moment. I'm new to this videoing game and everything I know about it. I've either been taught by people younger than myself or learning from watching television uh, and seeing mistakes other people make. I gather there are two things that are fairly important. One is continuity. In other words, as it's uh, recorded over a period of time, am I wearing the same shirt every time? And as it's recorded over a period of time, do I end up with a beard? We shall see. The other thing, of course, is the background. And uh, that can be quite distracting, or if the speaker is particularly boring, it can be quite uh, interesting. Over my head, there's a, a painting of Gorsi Bank in Worksworth, which has no significance for the service at all, except that my daughter and son-in-law live there, and uh, they gave me the picture, which I like. The other thing, of course, is the clock, which is significant. It's got a story to tell, inevitably, and I'm not going to tell all of the story now. Sufficient to say that it's been ticking away since about 1875, and for much of its life it was recording the time in the Governor House at the Gasworks belonging to the Gaslight and Co Company in Southall in West London. In 1908 the Governor House was refurbished and the clock was liberated and uh, eventually found its way to me. The clock, it doesn't tell the right time because the hour hand slips on the shaft and it's just one more repair job that's got to be done sometime. The clock is made from brass. It's called a skeleton clock because of its brass frame. It's covered in a glass dome and it's mounted all those years ago on uh, an oval piece of wood. I've put it on an elm shelf, a piece of elm that I liberated from somewhere else a few years ago uh, and I enjoyed making it because it's a lovely wood to work. Around it are the things I use. There's a cloth and a spray to clean my glasses. On the right there are my hearing aids, not being worn, you'll notice. There's a pencil with a rubber on the end. Why there are three sharpeners, I've no idea. There are tweezers so that I can keep a grip on things. And an address card from my friends Roger and Eileen who moved to Devon probably two, three years ago. I have an invitation to visit. I haven't got round to that yet. But I keep it there partly to remind me to visit and also to remind me of them and other friends, which is quite good at this time. Having all those things there it kind of leads my thoughts in the right direction for us to share in our prayers. Let us pray. Lord our God, the clock ticks away each passing second, but you are eternal, unchanging, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You called everything into being, and we thank you that you have given to us the gift of each passing second. We thank you that your creation supplies us light and heat, food and shelter, brass and glass and wood, and the creativity to use them. We thank you that we can see and hear and sense the world around us. We thank you for colour, for music, the sound of voices, the smell of flowers. With my pencil I can write and draw. With my rubber I can erase my mistakes. You revealed yourself to us in Jesus, your Son. In him we see your love and through him we know your forgiveness. You erase our mistakes, even the big ones, so that we are not burdened by the past. But if we open ourselves to your Spirit, you lead us onward into the future. We thank you for the friendship of your Spirit and the friendship we share with each other our friends here, our families and those from whom we are distanced, friends in other parts of the world. 
We thank you too that we are part of a wider circle. The people who deliver our food, empty our bins, and those who care for the sick and elderly. In you we are all one human family, regardless of, ethnic, regardless of ethnic groups and cultural heritage. Keep us close, in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord's Prayer Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and to deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thy norm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be Thou our God while troubles last, and our eternal Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. Buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out of fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, 
don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Romans chapter 10, verses 5 to 15. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, Who will descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Since I was a teenager, I've been building model railway trains. Forty years ago, I even built a model railway in the man's garden. Here is Lawrence when he was able to see and was blonde. Where did that come from? For me, lockdown has been a time of opportunity. Now, I've been building a railway that tells my story in my world. It's based on an inner London station at Pimlico. It has never existed except in my head. It brings in commuters from Reading and Slough, a branch line train from Greenford or Uxbridge. If I want to, it brings in milk from Devon and Somerset, tomatoes from Weymouth, bananas from Avonmouth, chocolate from the Friars factory near Bristol, and all this in my living room and dining room. It's my world, and this is the story I tell. My friend Jeff Lord, who worships at St Paul's, has an even better model railway. Due to lockdown, I couldn't ask if I could video it, but it tells a different story. It's not set in London like this one, but in the mountains of North Wales. It's a narrow gauge railway that brings slates down from the hills. It has lovely scenery. We both enjoy running trains, but we each tell a different story. St Paul didn't have a model railway, but he was still trying to tell a story. A story that would explain to people what life is about and how we relate to God. And at this point I'm going to uh, have to use some bits of paper to uh, uh, say what needs to be said, because, you know, normally I don't use bits of paper at all, but it would be so easy to get jumbled up here. In the uh, letter to Romans that we've just heard, he said, Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. And then he goes on to say that 
Uh, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a traditional way of putting it. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. And then he goes on to talk about Jews and Greeks and says, The Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For, and he's quoting here, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He then goes on to talk about how can they be saved if they haven't heard, and the fact that uh, the children of Israel, the Jews, have heard and haven't responded. So it all gets a bit complicated. So let me give you a quick rundown uh, on the story that we tell, or one version of the story that we tell, to try and understand all this. Once again, I resort to paper because sometimes you might want to quote back at me and I need to be ready for where I've made a mistake. We humans have a constant battle with ourselves. The self-interest that sustains us, like I need to eat, I need to breed, and the selfishness that can destroy us. Greed, gluttony, lust, all that stuff. The evil we do through misguided selfishness. Then there's the association humans have long made between adversity and our own actions. In the Old Testament, how many battles are lost, not because of bad planning, inferior military strength or unexpected ambush, but because, quote, the people sinned before the Lord. Guilt has a long and powerful history. For millennia, people have tried to make peace with the gods, and I use the plural there because this goes back for millennia and in so many different cultures. Uh, you've got to keep on the right side of the gods, otherwise you suffer. So for millennia, people have tried to make peace with the gods by making sacrifices and giving gifts. Now, traditional Christian theology declares that Jesus was sacrificed so that our sins are forgiven so we get rid of the guilt. A righteous man sacrificed to a just God. Add in a few details about descending into hell and how Satan fits into all that, and that has kept theologians busy for 20 centuries. A simplified version of the story is that we are justified, whatever that means, by Christ's sacrifice. Faith in Jesus, whatever that means, leads to salvation, whatever that means. Sanctification, whatever that means, is given to us to lead us to do good works or good works result in sanctification. Take your pick. And that's the problem, really, that over the centuries, Christian theologians have examined all these things and weighed them up. And some express it in one way and others express it in another way. The Catholics and the Lutherans look upon justification in one way, the Protestants, and believe it or not, the Eastern Orthodox Church in another. And the Methodists have quite a lot to say about salvation and justification, or at least John Wesley did, and he aligns himself really with uh, the Catholics and the Lutherans. But what are we to make of all this? There's a simple problem here. During lockdown, I've gone to Sainsbury's from time to time, to get the necessary stuff to keep body and soul together. I normally have been at that time between uh, eight and nine when grey-haired old folks like me uh, can get in there without too much trouble. I've discovered since that whenever you go it's not really too much trouble. But I have had the opportunity to stand in the queue with other people similar age to me and listen to their conversations. And some of the things that people have said about the virus, its cause and where it came from and what it's all about, absolute rubbish. I thought we lived in a rational, clear thinking time when science gave us an understanding of the world. But really, some of the stuff I've heard. So here's the challenge. I can't go up to someone and say, even though they believe in some strange and weird things, I can't say to them, are you saved? Or have you been justified by faith? Do you know that you were sanctified at baptism or that you will be sanctified when you reach the end of your life? Because their response would be a one word response. What? 
it doesn't make sense. And that's the problem we have individually and in the church to try and express the story in a way that will, uh, people will be able to grasp and understand. I'll try and uh, explain it to you in what is really a fairly simple parable, but it does involve going into the workshop and that'll be an education for you. My workshop is really a manifestation of my mind. Shall we say somewhat informal, some would say disorganised. But I know where everything is and if you want something I can give it to you. But come and have a look at this. Because they have this set of dining chairs that also fit into that description. And ages ago I'd said to them that I'd be willing to have a look at them if they'd like me to. So that's where we find ourselves today. Here's one of the chairs. You see it's a very um, elegant looking thing. It's a, a bit different to uh, what you get from Ikea. Now as far as we know they date, they date from the late 18th century. And when I came to take them apart uh, I could see that that was the case. Okay, that I'm sure you can see the movement in the joints there. And uh, when I came to look, the joints at the back, the bit that really takes the, the strain, are actually dowel joints, which is pretty much an 18th century, turn of the 19th century thing. When you get to look at it, of course, you find that the dowels are not standard size for today. But that's no problem because there's plenty of wood here and I can turn up some dowels that will replace them to the right size. I've even got some beech. Look at this. Beech wood. Lovely stuff. It's got a nice pink colour to it. And uh, that's... Um, I'll, I'll turn some dowels up at that. The back of the chair here, you can see it's sort of a bit uh, loose and floppy. It's sort of not fixed in there at all. There's a bit missing, but fortunately, got everything here. A bit of American walnut, that'll do the job nicely. I'll make a little sliver out of that and put it in. As I was doing it, because I think about things as I go along, uh, some words from the Bible sprang to mind. Actually, from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, uh, in the bit where uh, the writer refers to uh, Jesus as Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Just before that, he says, Behold, I make all things new. Uh, I, I thought of that with these chairs, because if I work at them and see how it goes, they, they will become uh, almost like new, I'm sure. However, uh, there are things there that I can't make uh, look completely new. They're still going to carry the weaknesses and the battle scars of uh, uh, the years. Uh, for instance, part of the frame here where the back joins in. You can see, I'm not sure how that could have happened in the last 200 years, but it's ripped out the side of the rail as well. So if I put, uh, you see this side's got a nice wooden bracket which also needs re-gluing. I could make another bracket like this. I think this one's made out of oak, actually. Um, or I could uh, make a steel bracket that would go in there. But that does seem to be a bit uh, sacrilegious, doesn't it, when you've got a chair uh, as nice as this. So, yeah, maybe I can make it new, but it's still going to carry the scars and the marks of the last 200 years. The words from the book of Revelation are not particularly relevant here because uh, the writer, St John the Divine, was talking about the New Jerusalem and all that kind of thing. Uh, so I must avoid going off on a tangent there. But Paul uses similar words when he's writing to the Corinthians because in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, he says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, if you like, you can wrestle with Paul's story of salvation, justification, perfection. And John Wesley's 44 sermons, which I know as good Methodists you all have on your bookshelves, they'll help you in that direction. 
But then again, in our reading from Matthew, we see Peter stepping out of the boat and coming up to his eyes in Sea of Galilee. When he said, Lord, save me, Jesus didn't tell him a story of low pressure areas causing squalls on the Sea of Galilee, shallow draft boats being unstable in turbulent water, or even the geological structure of the seabed. He said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In other words, he was saying to Peter, Trust me. Now, if John and Kay can trust me to save their damaged and broken chair, restore it to its original function and make it what it's meant to be, I can trust Jesus to do the same for me. How about you? Now let us pray. Father God, we feel battered by the waves, far from land with the wind against us. Help us to place our trust in you. We pray for people who feel battered by storms of economic hardship, unemployment, racism and abuse. We pray for people who feel far from familiar land, unable to go out and meet with others, wrestling with digital technology to see a familiar face, being unable to hug or sing, becoming contactless in so many ways. We pray for those people struggling with the stormy winds of change. We pray for our leaders who, like the rest of us, make mistakes. Give them insight and good judgment. We pray for scientists, economists and statisticians who struggle to interpret the data. We pray for nurses and doctors, shopkeepers and lorry drivers, journalists and broadcasters, the people who keep things going. We pray for the church and our leaders as we travel through changing and unfamiliar circumstances. We pray for young people who have to make sense of all this. When we feel we are being overwhelmed, we reach out to you. Lord, save us. We offer our prayers in the name of Jesus in whom we trust. Amen.
For our final blessing, I'm going to read to you some words from a poet with whom I've had quite a close connection over the years. I started reading his poem probably when I was about uh, eight or nine, partly because at my junior school I had a teacher uh, who used to encourage us to sing uh, one or two of his poems that were set to music. It is uh, John Whittier, and uh, anyone who's got the full name John Greenleaf Whittier has got to be worth reading again. But uh, most of his poems that have been set to music and used to be in the Methodist hymn book have bit by bit been dropped out of it for probably um, good reasons. You know, the words uh, are fairly um, uh, old. And I think the only one we have in Singing the Faith is one of the favourite hymns in the English language, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. What I'm going to read to you here are two verses from a poem called The Eternal Goodness. It's 22 verses long, but I'm only going to read two. And uh, I, I used to read these words when I was young because I used to go out and about all over the place. My mum was very uh, um, kind in that she'd let me go out on my own. In my early teens, I'd go up to London, uh, maybe to the museums or wander around St Paul's or Westminster Abbey or whatever in the days when it, it was free to get in. But uh, I know she worried about me a bit, but I always used to carry in my mind these words and they seem appropriate for us now as we think about trust in, uh, in Jesus. I know not what the future hath, of marvel or surprise, assured alone that life and death his mercy underlies. I know not where his islands lift their fronded palms in air. I only know I cannot drift beyond his love and care. <laughs> 